A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers, your attitude must be that of Christ. Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He was known to be of human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. Because of this, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every other name, so that at Jesus' name every knee must bend in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. Verbum Domini. The name of the Lord shall be blessed forever. Praise, you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forever. From the rising to the setting of the sun is the name of the Lord to be praised. High above all nations is the Lord. Above the heavens is his glory. Who is like the Lord, our God, who is enthroned on high and looks upon the heavens and the earth below? He raises up the lowly from the dust. From the dunghill he lifts up the poor to seat them with the princes, with the princes of his own people. Dominus Vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthew. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, was engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, an upright man, unwilling to expose her to the law, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention, when suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream and said to him, Joseph, son of David, have no fear about taking Mary as your wife. It is by the Holy Spirit that she has conceived this child. She is to have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this happened to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, The virgin shall be with child and give birth to a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. Verbum Domini, 
This great mystery, which has been hidden through all ages and from all generations, is now revealed to all of us. Advent, Christmas, Christmas tide, Epiphany, leading up to the baptism of the Lord. Today, appropriately, between these days of the solemnity of the Epiphany, and the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ this forthcoming Sunday, we celebrate the most holy name of Jesus at this appropriate time of the year. This great mystery which has been hidden through all ages and from all generations is now revealed to all of us. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. To confess the Son's name, Jesus, is to part and parcel give glory to his heavenly Father, our heavenly Father. There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Acts chapter 4. The first quote coming from Philippians chapter 2, which also served as part of our first reading. My friends, the shepherds have adored The angels have sung to them glory to God in the highest, in the pastures and meadows, and the magi have adored on bended knee the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And so today we honor the great revealed mystery by name, Jesus Christ. And this is a memorial that is proper to the Franciscan calendar and is also now on the American calendar as an optional memorial. Jesus Christ came to redeem the world, to save the world from sin. Time and again in the four Gospels, Jesus talks about the necessity for repentance. Jesus talks about the necessity of foregoing sin. He tells the adulterous woman, go and sin no more. Jesus, in the Gospels, tells us to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, in Matthew chapter 4. Time and again does Jesus talk about sin. This is why he came into the world, to redeem us, to save us from sin. It's difficult for us to understand Jesus' preoccupation with repentance in the Gospels unless we put ourselves in his place, that is, on the cross. He died for us on the cross to wipe away all sin. He died on Calvary to take away our sins. He greatly desires that we repent and accept this supreme act of love on the cross. At the beginning of his public ministry, when John the Baptist sees him at a distance approaching the Jordan, what does John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God, he who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to take away sin. We must accept this fact. Otherwise, his coming is for naught. His dying on the cross for us is for naught. On the first evening of his resurrection, he commissioned his apostles to forgive sins in his name, this name we honor today, John chapter 20, verse 23. 
Before his ascension into heaven, 40 days after his resurrection, he sent out his apostles and each one of us, really, to preach repentance to all the nations. Luke 24, verse 47. And at Pentecost, he and the Father even sent God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins and leads us to repent. John chapter 16, verse 8. Jesus came to redeem us, to save us from sin. This fact cannot be forgotten during the celebration of his most holy name. This most holy name that we appropriately celebrate during this Christmas tide period. We must begin the new year right. Apply to your sins the blood Jesus shed on Calvary. Repent. Celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation and rejoice. There's great joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Luke chapter 15, verse 7. Our prayer should be today, Heavenly Father, through your Son, in the Holy Spirit, may this be a year of repentance for me in the here and now. The holy name of Jesus means God saves, as we heard in today's gospel, which means we need saving. (laughs) Praise you, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess your most adorable and holy name, which again means God saves. Which means simply, we need saving, huh? Philippians chapter 2 also says, Work with anxious concern to achieve your salvation. How's that for a bumper sticker? Talk about evangelization. Work with anxious concern to achieve your salvation. For it is God who, in his good will toward you, begets in you any measure of desire or achievement. Therefore, in everything you do, act without grumbling or arguing. Prove yourselves innocent and straightforward, children of God beyond reproach. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in number 1849, under a heading titled The Definition of Sin, gives us per se the very definition of sin according to Catholic Christian doctrine. It says this, Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is failure in genuine love for God and neighbor caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. It wounds the nature of man and injures human solidarity. It has been defined by St. Augustine as, quote, an utterance, a deed, or a desire contrary to the eternal law. This is why the confidior during the penitential rite at the beginning of Mass is so important. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my own fault. In my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, sins of commission, and in what I have failed to do, sins of omission. The confidior should also be said by all as one of the last prayers in the evening before we retire, or any act of contrition, which the confidior is as well, an act of contrition. Always, always end your day with an act of contrition. Always, always begin your day with a morning offering. Consecrating your whole day, your five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, to Almighty God. Sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is failure and genuine love for God and neighbor caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. It wounds the nature of man and injures human solidarity. It has been defined by St. Augustine as, quote, an utterance, a deed, or a desire contrary to the eternal law of God. 
number 1849 of the Catechism. And in number 1865 of the Catechism, we read that sin, by its very nature, creates a proclivity toward further sin. What's that mean? This proclivity of sin toward sin. It means that sin, unchecked in a person's life, breeds further sin. Sin has the power, and that's not too strong of a word. Sin has the power to induce further sin. Listen to this, number 1865 of the Catechism. Sin creates a proclivity towards sin. It engenders vice by repetition of the same acts. This results in perverse inclinations which cloud conscience and corrupts the concrete judgment between good and evil. So it is that sin tends to reproduce itself and reinforce itself in the person's life. This is why a daily examination of conscience is so important. And if you're only conscious of venial sin, make a good act of contrition, a perfect act of contrition, where you fear sinning, period, because it offends God. Make a good, perfect act of contrition, and those venial sins, my brothers and sisters, are wiped away. And during your daily examination of conscience, if you become aware of a mortal sin, get to the sacrament of penance, reconciliation, confession, as soon as possible. Sin creates a proclivity to sin. It engenders vice by repetition of the same acts. This results in perverse inclinations which cloud conscience and corrupts the concrete judgment of good and evil. Thus, sin tends to reproduce itself and reinforce itself, that is, in the person's life. Consequently, the more we sin and the more it goes unchecked, the more unaware we become of our desperate need to repent. This sin blindness, we could call it, is more difficult to remove than physical blindness in one sense. Only God and those speaking in God's name, that is, the prophets of the Old Testament, the validly ordained priests of the New Testament, have the power to break through sin blindness in Jesus' name, this name we honor today. Now Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 18 from the Old Testament, prophesied that there would one day come the ultimate prophet capital U, capital P, one day there would come the ultimate prophet who would break through all sin blindness, period. And this ultimate prophet is Jesus Christ, the God-man. God himself, the second person of the most holy, all adored, all of blessed trinity. God became man, Jesus Christ. God himself breaks through all sinned blindness. Jesus is Lord and God. His words and the words of his body, the church, are spirit and life. These words of his, given to us through his name, bear the secrets of our hearts and souls. They break through sin blindness and lead us to repentance. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 tells us, the secrets of man's heart will be disclosed, and he will fall down and worship God, declaring, God is really in our midst. And how true is that in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 25, And the secrets of man's heart will be disclosed, and he will fall down and worship God, declaring, God is really in our midst. In the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 states, He will be a sign of contradiction so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. You can't keep your sins from God. You may be able to keep them from your fellow human persons, your fellow human beings, but you cannot keep them from God. Hebrews chapter 4 states, God is able to discern reflections and thoughts of the human heart. 
No creature is concealed from him, but everything is naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must one day render an account. Luke chapter 12, verse 2 states, There is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. This passage reminds us that God is all-knowing, an all-knowing God. In other words, the Lord knows us. The Lord knows you. There is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be made known. The holy name of Jesus reminds us that Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. Think of the words of the Ecce Agnus Dei just before Holy Communion at Mass. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold He who takes away the sins of the world. Words of John the Baptist. Happy are we who are called to the Supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, that you should come under my roof, words of the centurion, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Healed through the power of the beautiful tribunal of mercy, the sacrament of penance. Simeon tells Mary that a heart shall pierce her, a sword shall pierce her heart, excuse me, And even though these past few days we've been bearing upon the beauty of an infant babe lying in a manger, our hearts should be pierced for what this baby coming into the world means. He's going to die for us. We were all born so that we may live. He was born to die. For us, that should pierce our hearts, that fact. We were born to live. He was born to die. For us, for our sins. Sin is real. The world today would have you believe otherwise. And remember, as Catholics, we love the world. We know that Christians are in the world, not of the world, but we are for the world. We love the world because God created it. We love it so much we want to sanctify it beginning with ourselves, personally, individually, by having proper self-knowledge of living a good, holy, and upright moral life and then share that good news with others. Give a proclivity to that good news to counteract the proclivity of sin toward further sin. We want to sanctify the world. So we have nothing against the world. But that having all been said, the world wants you to think that sin is not real. The worlds of agnosticism and atheism, secular humanism, relativism, indeed what Pope Benedict XVI would call the dictatorship of relativism, would all have you believe that sin is not real. Sin doesn't exist. There is no such thing. Everything is relative. There's no objective moral truth. There's nothing that you can say is always and everywhere wrong. But as Catholic Christians, we know that that is false. There are such things as intrinsic evils, things that are always and everywhere wrong. There are things that are evil in and of themselves. Sin is contagious, addictive, and deadly. Romans chapter 6. Sin naturally tends to become a whole way of life. That proclivity again, huh? Colossians 3 verse 7. Unless we repent, we will become entrenched in sin and it will run our lives, rob us of our human freedom and human dignity. It will use us and abuse us. And that point is when Satan laughs all the way to the bank. Because he knows that he's grabbed us. He's got hold of us. Without repentance, we will not be able to control sin. It will control us. If Jesus hadn't shed his blood to wash away our sins, 
sin would have wiped out humanity already. Let me ask a rhetorical question. And this focusing just on the moral life, morality. How many people, my dear friends, have actually proven the absolute truth of God's moral law precisely by not following it and thereby have turned their lives into experiments that have failed miserably? How many people have actually proven the absolute truth of God's moral law precisely by not following it? and thereby have turned their lives into experiments that have failed miserably. But the good news is, Jesus Christ, who came to wipe away sin, the ultimate prophet, the God-man himself, who has come to break through all sin blindness, and through the blessed and holy tribunal of mercy, the sacrament of penance, reconciliation, confession, wipes away all sin and gives back to the individual soul the beauty of their baptismal innocence. What a gift we have. St. Augustine says, Wrong is wrong even if everyone else is doing it, and right is right even if no one else is doing it. Wrong is wrong even if everyone else is doing it, and right is right even if no one else is doing it. St. Augustine, he himself, who struggled for years with sin in his life. James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 tells us, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will take flight. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. What a great promise. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will take flight. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. Ephesians 5 tells us, Keep careful watch over your conduct. Do not act like fools. Make the most of the present opportunity, for these are evil days. Do not continue in your ignorance of sin. But try sincerely to discern the will of the Lord for you. And James chapter 4 says, You have no idea what kind of life will be yours tomorrow. You have no idea what kind of life will be yours tomorrow. This is why Scripture tells us so beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, This is the day of salvation. This is the day of the Lord. Precisely because we do not know what tomorrow holds. 1 Peter chapter 5, Stay sober and alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Solid in your faith. Stay sober and alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. How's that one for a bumper sticker? (laughs) 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. The most holy name of Jesus. Therefore God has highly exalted him and has bestowed upon him the name which is above every other name. So that that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. And again, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 12. There is no salvation through anyone else. Nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. The most holy name of Jesus. Let it always be ever 
on our mind and lips. May God bless you during this wonderful and beautiful Christmas tide season. God bless you.